we're not too worried about. Um, nope. Yep. There. Exactly. We're live. All right. Uh, we're going to get started in a minute here for for those who are just joining in. I had to kickstart the meeting. We have exactly two hours that we're allowed to uh, have a room open. So it's going to take all of the two hours and wanted to wait till the absolute last second to get everybody joined in here today. Um, all right, we're just going to get things started. Uh, we've got Kevin here and myself. And today we're going to talk about uh, really tips for everyday dashboards. Kevin's got a whole hour long presentation on formatting in in Tableau and how to really design great dashboards uh, using formatting. And then I'm gonna, in the second half, the second hour, just give general tips. I'm actually just gonna do, a, you know, I've got a list of tips for KPIs uh, and tables, but I'm actually gonna do a live build for, for a large chunk of it. So it's gonna be a fun session where you're just gonna see me build for like 30 minutes. Um, I certainly have a plan around what it's gonna, how it's gonna go, but then you're gonna see, right, the, a little bit of the, what, what could go wrong along the way, potentially. But Kevin's gonna go first, and I've got a, a fun intro here up on the, on the slides. So uh, let's just kick that off. So, you know, we're speaking, I already brought that up, uh, two Tableau Zen Masters here to talk about everyday dashboards. So I'll introduce myself one uh, more when it's my turn to speak, but we've got Kevin. Uh, he's from Northern Kentucky or the Cincinnati area, but I do know that if you're like, he lives in Kentucky, that pretty much everyone wants to say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm from Northern Kentucky. Uh, he's a Tableau Zen master. Uh, so I would be remiss not to mention that his brother is also, his twin brother is uh, also a Zen master and they both blog at flowledgetwins.com. Uh, probably the most popular blog for, well, maybe second most popular blog for uh, Tableau content for sure. Oh, and then he lost to me, not to mention he lost <laughs> to me in the finals of the Tableau tip battle at Tableau Conference 2018. And to me, it was like, I never was going to bring this up until I realized that it required knowledge of a sports team, <laughs> local sports team that Kevin is local to. So I didn't realize that he was from the Cincinnati area when I was creating the solution for it. Um, but either way, Kevin and I have remained pretty good friends through through all of it. And it's a, a gentle, uh, you know, laughing between the two of us here. But Kevin, I'm going to switch over so that you can take over and sort of just run with it. Right. Um, super excited to have you join and, you know, put together really an ad hoc webinar when it comes down to it. All right. Let me see if I can. And, um, I think you have to turn your. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. And it's got me grayed out. It's not letting me share there, Luke. Oh, fun. Great, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see here. Do I have anything that I can press? Settings? Hmm. I'm gonna eject you as a presenter and see if that does anything. Well, it'll let me, it's let me um, share my application window, but not oh, not the entire screen for some, oh, there it goes, I got it. It's my fault. It's not Luke's fault, everybody. <laughs> it's my fault, so let me share now. Make, make sure you guys can see my, my slide. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, thank you, Luke, I appreciate the the nice compliments and then what I would call a Compl assault, which is like a nice thing and a insult kind of all wrapped into one. So, and, and, and for what it's worth, the, the tip battle in 2018 was, was a, a fun little session. And, um, I spent, a, we had uh, 10 minutes to do, uh, uh, like a final round viz, kind of like iron viz, where we only had 10 minutes. And I spent like six minutes of it drawing a pumpkin head in, um, in, in the PowerPoint. So, that's probably the reason I lost. So it probably had nothing to do with the fact that uh, uh, Luke's analysis destroyed mine. <laughs> so anyways, um, so thanks uh, for having me, uh, uh, Luke. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about simple steps for better design. 
Uh, just a little bit about me. I know that uh, Luke kind of dug into that, but my name is Kevin Flerlage. I'm a senior analyst and Tableau developer for Unifund. Uh, Unifund is a small company in Cincinnati, Ohio, about 100 employees, and it's ran by, um, we're in the financial services, and it's ran by five-time Tableau Zen master Jeff Schaefer. So um, he's been a great mentor and, and learned a lot from him. Um, as Luke mentioned, I am an identical twin. This is me on the left and my brother, Ken Flerlidge on the right. Ken was using Tableau for about two years longer than me. And uh, he's really the one that introduced Tableau to me. Um, it wasn't because he was doing it that I got interested in it. It was because um, I was kind of looking for my next path and every job application I looked for and at uh, in um, in the field of analytics, which is you know, something I've been doing with Excel for a long time. But every one of those job postings had Tableau on it. So I just kind of hit him up and, and he kind of showed me the ropes and, and we talk more ever than ever uh, now that we're both uh, in the Tableau world. So Ken is a uh, uh, three times Zen master. Like I said, he was using Tableau for about two years longer than me. And, and uh, this year I became ten, uh, Zen master as well. So we're identical twin Zen masters. So very, very cool thing to to uh, to share with my brother. And he doesn't even live near me. But uh, like I said, we're really closer than we ever were before. Um, I, I'll kind of save this. Uh, uh, Luke kind of went through it, but um, you know, I'm a Tableau Zen master, and I lead some of the, some of the tugs. And and you may have heard the Data Fam Community Jam is something that I help co-lead. So um, uh, intertwined and, and really invested in in our Tableau community. So all right, let's just kind of get to it. So most presentations that I do are more technical how-to type presentations. So I've done a lot of stuff um, related to fixed LODs and new features. I spent last year talking about new features because there's so many cool ones last year and dashboard actions and spatial analysis, tableau prep. Um, but one of these questions that kind of always come up are, is, you know, what about design? And what I find and a lot of people will say is it designs kind of hard to teach. Um, when my brother and I were young, we spent, you know, I'd say maybe 10 or 11 years old, really a larger range than that. But I really remember it being prevalent when we were around 10 or 11 years old. We spent hours just sitting there drawing. Uh, we would draw pictures of, of transformers and uh, something called mad balls and garbage pail kids and anything we could draw, we would draw. Um, here's a couple of drawings from when Ken and I were, were 10 and or 11. Uh, the Grinch there is on the left is Ken's and Pinocchio on the right is mine. And inevitably, the question we got is, how do you draw like that? And our answer is, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to teach. I, I just don't know how to tell you how to draw well. So I believe that design in general, but specific for us is is design in Tableau, I, I believe it's kind of similar to drawing. So how do you learn it? I think some natural talent certainly helps, um, but I've seen a lot of people become really good designers in Tableau that aren't necessarily, uh, weren't necessarily uh, initially good designers or didn't have that uh, strong natural talent. Um, the most important things in my opinion are, are training, practicing and emulating others. And if you're involved in the Tableau community on Twitter or LinkedIn, I mean, that's a really great way to see what others are doing, see the kinds of designs they're putting together, look at the best practices um, and, 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 and emulate um, and emulate them. Uh, there's a, Paul, a quote from Paul Rand that says, design, design can be art, design can be aesthetics. Design is simple and that's why it's so complicated. And I feel like that is so true. Design doesn't have to be complicated, but it is complicated. So today's goal is to kind of make it simple. Um, so what I'm going to do throughout this presentation, and we're going to go through like 26 different uh, scenarios. We're going to look at bad design versus good design. And they will be noted this way. You're going to have a little thumbs down for bad design. You're going to have the thumbs up for good design. All right. So let's just walk through an example of good design and bad design. Number one, good design. I mean, excuse me, bad design. My brother, good design me. See, and if all a couple hundred of us were gathered in a lot in a room right now, I'd hear an eruption of laughter. You guys would be just just dying laughing because that was a hilarious joke. 
but I can't hear you. So I'll just assume I'll turn the laugh track on next time. So my definition of design is going to be really loosely used. I'm going to talk about color and layout and alignment, aspect ratio, size, um, just making things look good, white space, um, uh, transparency. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. Uh, some of it is, you know, just about making something look nice and engaging. Uh, a lot of it's going to be about best practices. So, you know, thinking about color usage uh, for people that have visual impairments, those types of things. So we're going to walk through a bunch of different things. And just remember, the word design isn't just about making things look nice. It's going to be really, um, uh, really lots of different areas of focus. Not planning on teaching you uh, everything about design, that'd be impossible. We're not going to get into Illustrator or, or anything like that. We are going to just talk about uh, single chart types and we're going to talk about, um, for the most part, single chart types, sometimes dashboards. And we're just going to talk about simple ways to improve um, design. Okay. Don't feel like you need to take notes or anything like that. This is all broken down in a blog post and an example viz on our website. Um, and you can take a screenshot here or just wait for the recording and you can go to that and you can check it out and it'll walk you through pretty much everything I'm going to talk about today. All right, so we're going to get to it. I'm going to jump to Tableau. And like I said, we got 26 different of these. We'll, we'll, we'll take a little break in the middle um, just because at times it'll feel I use the word listy, um, but we're going to kind of just go rapid fire through these things. So we'll, we'll take a little intermission uh, just so we can take uh, take a deep breath. So, all right. Number one, this seems very simple, but I see it all the time. And I reviewed a, a viz from somebody uh, in the community the other day and I didn't have this. So uh, very simple. Add a title. Um, if you have a dashboard, just show a title. And, and the reason is it just gives your users some sort of um inclination to what you're going to be talking about. So on the left, I, I really don't know what we're showing in this dashboard. What are we focused on? Um, I can look at the vans and I can look at the maps and I can look at the, you know, the, the bar charts and I can dig in and figure that out, which we're going to do eventually anyways, but uh, just give them a title. And to be quite honest, it just looks nicer too, but give them a title, give them some sort of information, um, give them some understanding what this dashboard will be digging into and uh, you'll have a lot greater adoption, a lot easier um, uh, understanding. Grid lines. When I first started, people always said, just get rid of the grid lines. I, I don't think I necessarily agree with that, but, um, but in general, uh, grid lines can be really helpful, but you never want them to be the, the star of the show. In this left example of, of bad design, we have just a simple bar chart looking at uh, subcategory, uh, sales by sub subcategory, and we have a ton of dark grid lines. We've got them for every 20,000. We've got them both horizontal and vertical. Um, they're really, really dark. And I think if you're like me, you're staring at the grid lines, you're not looking at the bar charts at all. Uh, they're really distracting. And like I said, they sort of become the star of the show. So what I tend to do is use less of them and make them lighter. Um, in this case, uh, you can get rid of them all together if you like. In, in some cases, if you use a label or something like that. Um, but in this case, uh, what I've done is remove these horizontal grid lines. They're completely useless because the bars are pretty much uh, laying that out, laying out those subcategories for you. And then I've reduced them to, instead of every 20,000, I've made them every 50,000, and I've made them really, really light, almost so they go to the background. Uh, I like to make them light. I like to make them dotted lines. And so here we can see really quickly, without even hovering or anything like that, phones and chairs are probably around $320,000. So the grid lines help us um, understand the data a little bit better, um, but we want it to push it to the back and let it be sort of a visual aid, not, again, like I said, the star of the show. So you can just see visually on top of it being easier to read visually just looks a lot nicer. Next three, I'm going to talk about hex maps, and it almost seems weird to talk about hex maps three different times, but uh, I see this really, really, uh, really often where people use the wrong hex map shapes or they do some different things with hex maps. Now, I should first say that this is using uh, the shapes technique that Matt Chambers put together. It's just X and Y coordinates that you plot and then use a hex map shape. Uh, you could 
if you like, you could use a shape file instead and you don't have this problem. Luke Stanky provided, uh, created a really nice um, hex map shape file. I think he uh, hinged off of uh, Joshua um, Tafley's, uh, not Tafley, I'm from Milligan's uh, work. And, uh, but he, he really did a, a nice job of putting some, some padding between these. So if you use a shape file, you don't have to worry about this, but I tend to use uh, shapes just um, it feels a little more flexible to me. And one of the things that I see with people using shapes is they use the wrong shape. Now, okay, hexagon, you know, whatever, but uh, this these coordinates were built uh, for these vertically oriented shapes. And you can see how they, they as uh, Luke's company is called tessellation, these things tessellate really well. They fit together uh, really, really nicely. Um, if you use the wrong shape, this is a horizontally oriented shape. You can see they don't fit together. And the only reason for that is that the, the X, Y coordinates that Matt Chambers originally built were built using this uh, vertically oriented shape. So number one, make sure you're using the right hex shape because it just, uh, it's just cleaner to read um, and just looks uh, a, a ton nicer than, than using this, this other shape. Next is just make sure you're using your space. Um, you know, there's a whole argument about data to ink ratio. You know, in this case, it just looks sloppy when these things are spread out. It's harder to read. Uh, it's harder to make comparisons from, from one state to another. So what I always advise people is to make the shape as large as you possibly can without overlapping the other shapes, right? So you can see here, we've got tons of white space here. Uh, the labels are kind of hard to read and something happens when you make the, the shape smaller where the labels actually don't get centered properly for some reason. Um, so in this case, I just made them really large. We have a nice little white space around them, just a little bit of padding. It looks really nice and clean. The other thing I see is related to space is that people use more horizontal space than do vertical space. And we've got this, you know, they're not overlapping or anything like that. It just looks weird. Uh, it doesn't look like the United States, number one. And then we have these weird space in between just is is kind of unpleasing. Um, all together, you know, this is more about aesthetics, but in my opinion, when something's nice and clean with even spacing, that makes it a lot easier for your, your clients to read as well. All right, rotated text. This is, uh, I told you I worked for Jeff Schaefer. This is one of these um, cardinal sins for Jeff. And not to say there aren't times that you might use it, but um, but this is certainly something that he's always commented on. Because if I look at that first chart and I try to read those labels, I might be able to read it, but I find myself kind of wanting to turn my head so that I can actually read the, these labels. So now it's much easier to see March 2017, April 2017. Um, so generally I avoid, I would bet that I don't have rotated text in any single dashboard that I've created um, for my current company um, because there's just alternatives that make it much easier. Alternative of one would be to rotate the whole entire chart in a time series, I wouldn't do that like this, uh, most likely, because people most like most commonly think about time series as on horizontal axis. But if it was subcategory or something like that, I would just rotate the entire chart and that would give me space out to the left. We can actually kick back here and look at these grid lines. You see how I've just got this as a horizontal bar versus a, a vertical bar. That is usually my first go to. But if I got a time uh, series, what I would typically do instead of using rotated axes where we've got the month and the year, I would use two different blue pills to show that. So I would put a blue pill up here for year and then I put another one for month and then I can just abbreviate that month however we want. Maybe we can use three characters where we just use the first character. I think it's pretty easy to see that this is August 2017. This is September 2018. So a little bit better experience for users. It's cleaner. Uh, and for me, I think it's just easier to read. Another one of those those pet peeves for from Jeff Schaefer, and, and, and I'll tell you, a lot of this comes from Jeff just learning and working underneath him. Um, and uh, but one of these pet peeves is is um, is floating bars. As this is something I always did, and I never really understood the difference. But you can see the left, we kind of have these floating bars, and on the right, we have this nice base. Uh, for our bars to sit on. It kind of gives a starting point for everything. Um, 
uh, Ryan Sleeper in this, um, if you go to this viz on my Tableau Public page, Ryan Sleeper talks about this in a blog post. Um, this is, I think, one of his most popular blog posts ever called Beautiful Bar uh, Bars. And he really describes it as giving a strong base for your bars to sit on. So this is a common thing in the industry. And uh, yeah, just to make things feel a little bit uh, nicer, a little bit better starting point, just give it an axis to sit on. All right, let's talk a little bit about color. So uh, I think this is really common for new users uh, when they have different categories, they just wanna throw that category on color uh, so you can differentiate these colors uh, across these different subcategories. And what happens here is, you know, maybe it's not wrong, but when I see color, and I think this is a natural, um, something people naturally do is when you see color, you begin to try to interpret what that color means. So in this case, color is really just saying what subcategory it is. So I'm spending as a user, I'm spending my time trying to understand what these colors mean when they really mean nothing that I'm not already showing. So I've got the label right out here that says phones and chairs and in storage. Why do I need another color to, to represent that? Um, in most cases, and, and, and I'll say, not certainly all cases, but in most cases you don't. So in most cases, I would simply just use one color or I'd make everything gray and make uh, say, you know, one particular subcategory that I'm interested in, maybe make that red or a dark blue or something like that. But generally uh, there is no advantage to using all these different colors over just using one color. This is a lot cleaner and it, uh, it allows your users not to spend that extra try time trying to figure out what, what color means. Now, I will make a comment that there are times, uh, hopefully you can see this, and Tableau Public will refresh on me in a second, I'm sure, but um, there are certainly times when categorical, color, categorical colors make sense. So this is a, a visualization I built um, just in my spare time about um, uh, profits of, of different movies. And in this case, I use color throughout this visualization. Um, I wanted to look at, number one, what time frame a year are these movies released and uh, you know, which ones are more successful? So we can see movies in March seem to be more success successful. And then we see, you know, the trend where, um, where uh, movies in, in the summer start to get, get uh, strong. So throughout, so I, here I use color for every month and then throughout the visualization, I use the same colors to point back to that month. So we can easily see this pink is December. We can see that this red is is January, and this walks it through the entire viz. So that in that case, I think categorical colors. And there's that refresh I was talking about. Give it just one sec because I want to show one other thing. It probably makes a little more sense if we look at it uh, a little bit different way. So I also looked at this visualization by for some reason my screen is not moving. About that, this Halo Public was not working well for me. But I also looked at it um, by distributor. So we have Walt Disney in red, and you can see these gigantic bubbles from Walt Disney. Walt Disney didn't put out a lot of movies, but they put out Avengers Endgame, and they put out Captain Marvel and Aladdin, and they are the the highest grossing movies of the year. So um, we can kind of see this red Walt Disney throughout the entire biz. So Walt Disney uh, number of movies versus total gross. We can see the top six movies gross. Have, top seven out of eight or, or Disney movies. So categorical colors in this case make a lot of sense. So generally what I'm talking about when I when I look at categorical, color, categorical colors or this entire uh, presentation is really just guardrails of, in most cases, um, this, this is the best practice. A little bit more about color. Um, if you're not aware, somewhere around eight or 9% of the male population has some sort of um, color deficiency to uh, color blindness specifically. And um, we should really uh, design to that. Now, if you're designing dashboards for three people and you know, they're not colorblind. Okay. Maybe that's, maybe that's a non-issue. Um, but for, for um, most cases, we should really be careful to design um, for color deficiency. We hear a ton about the red and green. You can, you can see that my my down and up uh, thumbs are are red and blue, not red and green. Um, it's kind of just standard. We just uh, most of us don't use red and green color palettes any longer. Um, but it's more than just red and green that are problems. Uh, this is an example of a red and a brown. So I think if your if your vision is 
uh, you don't have any color deficiency, you'd probably easily tell the difference between these red and brown. Um, but if you do, these things look uh, an awful lot alike. So I'm going to click this button here to simulate it. It's a little bit small. So this is normal vision up here. And this is the most common form of uh, color blindness. I'm even going to try and pronounce it. You can see those red and browns are almost identical. Uh, almost impossible to decipher, and especially in something like a scatter plot, it's going to be basically useless. So I always recommend to people that they use a colorblind simulator. Um, I have a link to one right here. It's called Coblis. All you do is uh, take a screenshot or a, a snip of your of your visualization. You upload that, and then you can flip through these different types of, of colorblindness, and you see how they are impacted. Um, so anytime I'm creating a visualization, I recommend that people uh, use colorblind simulator. In most cases, these sort of orange and, and blue, uh, it, it's kind of the standard in Tableau to use an orange and blue from good and bad. Um, they work really, really well. Anytime you implement sort of blue into one of these colors. So if you have a green, but it's a little bit of a bluish green, what you'll find is usually that's that's safe. I'm not going to dig too deep into that because Tons of people have written about this. One is from from Jeff Schaefer's website, Data Plus Science. He also doesn't he didn't just lead our company. He also teaches data visualization at the University of Cincinnati. And this blog post goes really, really deep into um, into uh, uh, designing for um, color deficiency. So I recommend you check it out and uh, and learn a lot more than I just gave you right there. This is uh, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but. I don't know what it is, but when people use highlight tables, they tend to want to fill the space. Um, it's just a really, really common common thing that I see, especially in Makeover Monday. I know Eva and, and the team comment on this a lot, but uh, there's no reason to fill the space. You know, you can see this top one's really, really wide and it doesn't need to be really wide. Um, that actually causes problems when you're looking at the visualization. It's a lot harder for me to compare January Sunday in January to Saturday in December, because uh, they're so far apart from each other. The colors, it's harder to compare those colors. So if you're gonna do a highlight table, I always say try and make it almost square if you can. Make make it as, uh, as, as, as not, uh, squish it down as, as far as you can where you can show your numbers. Um, almost make it square, it doesn't have to be square, uh, but you'll, you'll save space. Uh, White space is always good, and you'll make the comparisons a lot a lot easier. So uh, for whatever reason, that seems to be a common mistake. So um, just, just make them on the square. Stacked bars. This is like this is every new user's uh, favorite chart, including mine. Um, and there are really good things about stacked bar charts, and there are some bad things about stacked bar charts. So we'll kind of dig into that. So if I look at that left side, uh, the bad side, you can see really easily um, that uh, 2018 Q4 was the highest uh, sales of, of any quarter. That's fantastic. I can see the entire the entire total really easily. I can see that 2015 Q1 was the worst. So um, that's a really good thing about a stack bar chart. It shows me the totals and I can compare the totals. The bad thing about a stacked bar chart is I can compare, say, these uh, bookcases. They're all start at the same point. I can easily compare them. I can see that Q3 2016, we sold more bookcases than any other quarter. But when I start to try and compare the values on the other side of that bar, say binders or appliances or accessories, it's really hard to compare. It's hard for me to tell if this is larger or this is larger or is, Q1 2015 bigger than Q1 2016. It's really difficult to tell because they're not starting at the same point. So what I typically advise, and and, and, I, and I'll be straight up, I probably made a mistake in, in this visualization um, because one thing I'm losing here, at losing that I have over here that I don't have over here is a, is a total. So typically what I do is break these out into different bars so instead of stacking them, I have accessories, appliance, binders, and, and bookcases all in their own bars so that I can actually compare them within those subcategories. Uh, but I probably should have shown a, a, a total as well so I can compare the totals. Um, another really great technique, and I'll, I'll go to this. So look, I've linked up here two different uh, blog posts. Um, 
This is uh, from Steve Wexler. This is from Ryan Sleeper. I mentioned Ryan earlier. So he does this really great uh, technique, and I use this all the time in my dashboards, is to allow the user to change how those bars are uh, stacked on the fly. So then they can compare any section that they want. This is a really great technique. So you can see he's got the stacked bar, but he'll use a parameter action. He allows the user to click on the segment and send that to the axis. And actually it looks like he might be using a set action instead of a parameter action. But you can see that allows any of the user at any time just to click the segment they want to compare and they can compare. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. We see the total. Plus, we're able to compare any individual segment or group of segments um, if we use a set action. So really nice technique. I'd advise doing that if you're going to use a stack bar chart. We can hear all the arguments about pie charts. I think they're actually really useful in a, in a couple of different situations. On the left is not useful. <laughs> we can make no real comparisons. They can't tell what this is. Maybe. I don't know, 10%, I'm guessing, maybe. Is this bigger than this? Uh, it's just really not very useful to have a dozen different slices in a pie chart. Uh, I actually think it makes it even worse when we're looking at a donut chart because we don't have that sort of uh, center point reference. Um, if you're going to use a pie chart, I think they work out well with two or three slices. I think in, in a lot of cases, you know, we're all used to reading a clock. We're all used to eating pizza or a pie and we can quickly tell when something's almost 25%. So at a glance, I think we would be able to guess this to be 18, 19, 20% uh, without even a label on here. So in with two slices, I think it's perfectly fine. Um, maybe three slices as well. As well. But um, in most cases, I just change them to a bar chart. Uh, um, tree maps sometimes, but uh, for generally, uh, I just would change this to a, a bar chart. Again, another another link to a, a great blog post on uh, pie charts from from in their works. And another one of these things that you could argue to death: Do you want to use radial charts in your business dashboards? Maybe you use them in your in your private stuff, just fooling around. This is something that I, I did for NCAA football, just playing around in my personal life, but um, I enjoy them. I think they're fun. Maybe they're not best practice, but if you're going to use them, you know, we're not going to order, we're not going to argue the point whether they're best practice or not. If you're going to use them, what I'd recommend is you make them have an aspect ratio of one to one. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, this looks weird. This just looks weird. This looks really nice, really clean. Um, I see no reason to take something that's supposed to be circular and turn it into an oval. That's number one. Number two is, yeah, and again, we could argue the best practice of a radio chart in the first place, but if we're going to use this chart and we squished this vertically, these bars that come out here actually look longer than the bars that come down here. It's because we squished it. So if we're going to try and use this um, in a visualization, we really should make it as easy, easy, easy for our users to use. And making these total bars uh, smaller than these makes makes no sense whatsoever. I would apply the same exact concept to a waffle chart. I often see waffle charts that are like really long rectangles. They're just harder to read. You know, a lawful chart is laid out as a 10 by 10 grid meant to represent 100%. Um, so for me, there's no reason that the height should be, you know, smaller than the length. Um, they really should be a one-to-one -one ratio. And generally, it just, um, just looks nicer. All right. So that was a lot. We're at 233, so I'm going to have to probably push pretty quickly. But um, I just want to kind of everybody take a little break. Um, and I wanted to just talk briefly about one thing. If you didn't know, I've made this pretty public um, back in uh, back in late June. Actually, this is you know at the point where I'd not heard of anybody having COVID nineteen. Actually, uh, came down with it myself. So I, we had a little. Uh, my wife turned forty this year. Um, we were talking about. We had, uh, you know, a vacation canceled. We had a party canceled. We have all kinds of things canceled. And I just wanted to show my wife some sort of fun. So we decided as neighbors to to have a little backyard get together, stay outside. And um, I remember talking on my phone, uh, on the phone with somebody, a friend of mine saying, I literally know nobody that has COVID-19. Uh, well, 
the, the day after the party, I went for a run, made it about a tenth of a mile. My lungs are burning. And I called my wife and I said, I got it. I got it. And sure enough, I did. Um, and unlike a lot of people that got it, I had a ton of symptoms and I actually tracked these symptoms over over time. Um, you can see, I think around day six is when this isn't interactive. This is just an image. But um, every day around around day six, things just got really, really bad. Sore throat was one of the worst sore throats I've ever had. Uh, I just couldn't concentrate on anything. Horrible headaches, really bad fatigue. Um, but the most interesting thing that happened is uh, I think around day eight, I lost my taste completely. Zero taste whatsoever. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen this. If I can find where I put it. There we go. I'll pop this open and, and I'll turn the volume down. But my, my daughter, this is my daughter right here. She's a little bit, um, she's a little twisted. She said, you know, let's, let's make, uh, let's make you just eat a bunch of disgusting stuff. And, and I was game for it. That's fine. And, uh, so she got a bunch of stuff out of the fridge and just started blending it up. And, uh, I'll kind of show that she's got some broccoli and carrots and pickle juice. And the goal of this was make, uh, a, a, a topping for ice cream. <laughs> so she blended this all up ketchup, chocolate syrup, hot sauce from a local county joint, maple syrup. Hopefully you're seeing this okay. This is this is the disgusting part here. I'll, I'll, put, I'll just play this. Hopefully it's coming through okay. And she just kept pouring. And then uh, her twisted self, she made, made me eat it. So took a big scoop of it here. <laughs> And I will tell you, I didn't taste a thing. So it didn't bother me one bit whatsoever. Um, I promised people I did this a couple of different times with a couple of different things. I think I put uh, peanut butter on burgers, which somebody said was pretty good and chocolate syrup on mashed potatoes. I onions and mustard together, which are my least two least uh, most hated foods. That was worse than, than anything. Um, but ultimately, uh, she, I, she made me redo these when my taste returned. Uh, and I will tell you, this was the most vile concoction I've ever put in my mouth ever. So anyways, if you're on Twitter, you can go check that out. They're pretty funny videos and and uh, got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, action on that. So, all right. That was your short intermission watching me eat something vile and disgusting. Let's get back to it. I think labeling is is pretty simple. Um, you, you always in your in your dashboards want to avoid clutter when necessary. In this case, if you look at the the bad side, we've got looks like sales over time, and we have uh, the y axis showing from zero to eighty thousand, and then we've labeled every single month from December two thousand sixteen all the way up to two, December two thousand eighteen. So we have twenty four labels on here. Uh, and there's something weird about it. It's only showing one decimal point, so that doesn't make any more sense. So uh, this doesn't really work, in my opinion. It makes that chart really hard to read. It's very cluttered, uh, and it's not helpful. Um, we probably don't need any labels whatsoever because we have an x-axis or a y-axis to show that. So we can see that uh, looks like November 2018 is a little over 80,000. We can see that just by using uh, the y-axis. But if you want to show some labels, that's fine. I tend to uh, show either the min or min max, and that's just an option in Tableau. You can show the min max. You can show the the um, beginning and the ends of the lines, and that which I've done in this. Um, and to be like I said, to be quite honest, we're showing the y-axis. Probably don't need it at all. So if you look at the left chart versus the right chart, you'd see how much cleaner it is, how much easier it is to read, even though you're giving them essentially giving them less information. So just be careful and. Uh, not over labeling your charts. If you went to the conference in 2019, you probably heard um, people raving about Chantilly Jagernoff's uh, presentation on on design. That was uh, one of the best Tableau conference presentations I've ever seen. Uh, she's she's just a likable person and a, and a total rock star. Um, at the end of the the presentation, it was like. I can't even describe it. There was probably 400 people that flocked to the stage just to talk to her. It was insane. And uh, when my brother and I presented, uh, there was maybe 
30 people that came up. So uh, she's just uh, she's just an all star. And one of the things she talked about as part of design, she really she probably spent 10 or 15 minutes on it was, was the use of icons. She she loves to use icons. I think they're great for things like bands or, or even for bar charts and things like that. Um, they really give you quick information. That's what we do in data visualization. We, we allow somebody to see it visually versus just numbers and letters. So, um, but, but one of the things she talked about, and, and I'd have to be writing this blog post at the same time, was the use of, use of icons and using consistent icons. So on the left, we have a bowling icon that's an outline icon. Then we have this sort of cartoon icon, and then we have this sketch icon and it just doesn't feel consistent it feels really broken up and it looks like somebody just went out on the web and grabbed the first uh, set of three icons they could find that's exactly what i did um, and if you're going to use icons great i love them use them um, just make sure they're consistent um, for this is a group of icons that i got from the noun project uh, I, I have, subscription to the noun project is like 40 bucks a year. It's worth every penny. I'd pay five times that. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the noun, pro noun project is they have different designers and they have different uh, groups of icons that they design. So this all came from the same group of icons. You can see they're really, really consistent. They're all designed by the same person in the same way. And it just gives a nice feel to the dashboard. So if you're going to use icons, make sure they're consistent. Don't use outlines for some and fills for others. and in black and white for others. Maps and backgrounds. This isn't always possible, but if it's possible, I always try to, to clean those maps up as, as much as I can. So it's really common that I see a dashboard on a white background, and then they have this map that has this sort of grayish blue background, and it just feels choppy and broken up and inconsistent, and it just doesn't flow. Um, in this case, all my states are, are, have some sort of value associated with them. So what I can do is just get rid of that base layer altogether. Um, so we can just take that base layer off and we get this much cleaner map. Now, let's assume that you had no sales in Colorado. In this case, taking that base layer off, Colorado is going to disappear. There are ways that you can, you can address that. You can bring another data set that's... Uh, that just has all the different uh, states in there just to make sure that um, the states don't disappear and just don't color it. Um, or um, we can actually change the paint color. So there's different different ways. This blog post talks about minimalist maps. Uh, I recommend you look at that. But generally, just try and give that clean look. Try and match this background to the background of your visualization. If you're using a black background, you can use a dark, dark map uh, and turn the base layer off if you're using a light one use a light map and, and turn the base layer off. Um, it just gives a much, much cleaner look and much more consistent throughout. Transparency um, may seem obvious. I'm actually um, uh, working on something right now where, um, where transparency wasn't used at all. And, um, and if you look at this scatter plot, and, and transparency, you really should be used on anything with overlapping marks like dot plots or scatter plots or jitter plots. Um, in this case, you can see this isn't so bad, but when we get into this really dense area, we have no comprehension of the density of these marks. We don't have any feel whatsoever of that the, there's just these two or they're ones kind of stacked behind them or on top of them. You can kind of see there's one right there and there's one right there. Without a transparency, we don't see that. So really simple, um, just 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 um, knock the opacity down to give these marks a little bit of transparency. So then we can see the position. We also can see the density. So we see a ton of marks in, in this general area here. I also like, um, some people like to use gray borders. I like to match my border of my circle. I like to add a little border. I like to match it to the background. So I use a white border on a white background, a black border on a black background, just gives a nice little separation. Uh, for the mark. So, so knock the opacity down, give a little bit of a border so you can tell the difference between one mark and another. All right, diverging color palettes. Uh, this is a, a mistake I made over and over and over when I first started. Um, when we look at the left map, so this, these maps are showing sales by state, right? The uh, sales in the lowest and the, uh, the worst sales are $920 and the most are $460,000. And I've put this, just dropped a color palette on there and there we go. And 
what I see is, well, this is really hard to understand. I don't really understand this scale. Um, it's just harder for people to grasp this sort of red to white to blue type of scale. Um, and the, the reason for that is this, this white sort of um, naturally uh, insists some sort of, of, of midpoint right? It's some sort of midpoint between this dark red and this dark blue. Well, when I'm looking at sales, what is that? Is that average? Is that, um, you know, the overall average? Is it the uh, weighted average? Is it uh, unweighted average? What, what does that represent? And ultimately, when a users first look at this map, it's really difficult to understand. And I should note, this should probably be a hex map and not a uh, chlorpreth map. Um, when I look at this map, it's really easy for users to quickly understand what it's representing. Low sales are light blue, more sales are dark blue. So I can quickly see California has very high sales where West Virginia has very low sales, right? It's really a lot easier for a user to understand. Now, if we were looking at say profit margin, maybe we would show um, a diverging color palette and set that color palette to uh, the midpoint at zero, or maybe we're looking at a target from a prior year. Maybe we would uh, want to hit that target from the prior year and we would set that midpoint at zero. So the only time I ever recommend using diverging color palettes is, is when, you're, when you have a natural midpoint, things like zero comparing to a target, comparing to a value from the prior. Naturally, this is just going to be a lot easier if you're looking at just a range of values. I kind of talked about this before. I see this again. I see this with bar charts. Just wide charts are just kind of useless. There's just no reason to do this. Uh, I won't dig into this too much, but um, you get the same exact context from this as you do this. Uh, this provides no additional benefit and actually it's harder to read because I almost have to move my head from furniture over to see the length of the bar. Um, so you reduce the size. You don't want them to be tiny, but reduce the size. You have more space to, to add uh, more context um, to your visualization. I've got this sort of, oh, there we go. Got a little uh, webinar thing that says stop sharing right in my way. Number precision is also a common thing that I see. Um, on the left, I've got 38.1382%. And for total sales, I got 8,682,317. In most cases, unless you work for NASA or work for something very that is very, very, requires a lot of precision, most of the times you don't need that. And most occasions, it actually is a lot easier to read if you don't have it. So compare the 38.1% on the right to that 38.1382% on the left, you can see 38.1 is a lot easier to read um, and um, it gets you to the level that you, the required level for the user. At my office, we rarely go down to anything more than one decimal point for anything. Uh, there are cases that we do, but um, in most businesses, you don't really need that type of precision. It cleans up the design, gives you more space, gives you more white space, and just makes it easier to read. Same thing with uh, the total sales example, 8.7 million is more than efficient. Um, as it will, will do the job and you don't need those big long numbers. One technique I implement quite often uh, for people that might want the, the, the granular detail, and I don't have it on this, but what I'll do is make a copy of my calculation and I'll change the formatting and then I'll put that on the tooltip. So in this case, if I hovered over the 8.7 million, it would show this full full value. So if you want to show both, you can certainly do that. I just recommend doing it in the tooltip versus on the actual dashboard itself. All right, a little bit more about color coding and coding. If you were to, to glance on the left, uh, and saw these two scatter plots, you'd probably think without looking that the yellow here is the same as the yellow here and the blue here is the same as the blue here. Well, it's not. Here we're looking at corporate versus consumer and here we're looking at furniture versus office supplies. Um, I'm not trying to tell you to use, you know, 30 different colors in a dashboard, but in this case, it's pretty confusing that these represent two different things, even though they are somewhat, you know, they are labeled. Um, 
I'd always recommend in these types of situations with similar charts that are next to each other, try not to use the same colors because you're encoding to the user that yellow represents corporate and blue represents consumer. With that, if they don't pay attention, they're going to think that represents consumer and uh, corporate in this chart as well. So pretty simple, just trying to use some different colors. And obviously, as we talked about before, use um, colorblind safe colors. But in this case, I just used you know, the yellow and blue, and then I used a, a red and a gray just to show different things. Now, if they're really clearly labeled, if there's, I like to often put titles over my charts, and maybe I have the title that says, you know, corporate versus consumer sales or something like that. And I have corporate in, in yellow and I have consumer in blue, where it's very, very obvious to the user. Sometimes you can get away with using those same colors throughout. Uh, just be very, very careful with similar charts that are in the same same area. Um, another great blog post, this one's from Eva Murray, who runs the Makeover Monday Project. Uh, she wrote for Forbes and really talked and dove into the importance of color and data visualization. Uh, it'd be a good read uh, if you get the chance. This is more of just a Kevin pet peeve. Um, this may actually not apply to many dashboards, uh, work dashboards. And I think probably most of us design dashboards that fit on one screen. Uh, but in my my public life or my private life, I, I use a lot of um, uh, I create a lot of long form dashboards where you where I use the mouse wheel to scroll. And when you do that and there's a map in that visualization, what happens is I'm scrolling down the viz and then I hit this and then this happens. And this is really just annoying and frustrating. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And a lot of people don't know, a lot of users don't know how to use this toolbar to set it back. In this case, if you really look at the map, this is a map of Ohio, just calling out certain cities, major cities in Ohio. There's very little reason for me to zoom in. It's doing nothing. Zooming in doesn't, isn't necessary in this. So to avoid this, this, this frustrating scroll, um, and, and probably just a general, um, uh, best practices, don't even if you don't want them to explore the map, just turn those map controls off here. If you don't know, I'm using my mouse wheel and nothing's happening. It doesn't allow me to zoom in or anything like that. Um, I don't need the user to zoom in. So if you are focused on some general region where we're zooming in and panning and, and all that isn't necessary, just turn it off. Uh, I rarely see people turn these off and it's um, and it kind of becomes a little bit uh, of a frustrating thing as, as an end user. So just turn them off. You don't need them. This feels like something that uh, goes without saying, but if you're going to design a dashboard, design it to a grid. Um, make sure that your elements are aligned. And in this dashboard, I've, I'm tiling them, um, but you can see that this one is higher, you know, taller than this one. This one starts like it's almost indented. Um, this one doesn't align with this one, and this one doesn't align with this one. Um, it, it just gives a, a sloppy look. They're harder to read. Um, so I just recommend designing to a grid. If you're going to tile, um, which this is tiled, then you can typically just drop those in a tile and, and make sure that they are lined up. Um, sometimes you have to use padding to, to make sure your elements are aligned. I'm curious if I had to do that at all. This one, the, yeah, here I have a little bit of padding to, to make sure all the elements are aligned. But you can see here I've got these axes lined up. The heights are the same. The heights here are the same. Um, you know, where profit and sales show are the same. If you're going to, if you're a floater, um, which I do float sometimes, then you can use the layout tab up here. So I probably don't know if I have anything floating in here, but yeah, we can, we can change the positioning. And if you didn't know, you can actually just press the G on the keyboard. You don't have to do anything else other than press the G and it'll actually bring up a grid. So if you're a floater, then you can design specifically to that grid. Actually, if you come up here, go to dashboard and grid options, you can make those grids um, a little bit bigger. So you can see those grids um, a, a lot larger. To turn it off, just hit G again. So it's just as simple as hitting G and then hitting G again. You can design perfectly to a grid to make sure your elements are aligned. All right, buttons. Buttons, uh, you might not be aware, but I love buttons. Um, I created a a whole list of buttons. This thing's again going to refresh on me. I created a bunch of buttons in PowerPoint. I create all my buttons in PowerPoint. So I think they just look nicer. Uh, so I love buttons. Um, 
if we look at the kind of standard button that Tableau brings in, if you bring a, in a na dashboard navigation button, uh, it looks like this. For me, it's kind of blocky and doesn't look very nice. It's got those hard edges. Um, and it doesn't give you the user any real context on where you're going with it. Uh, I think I find the same thing with show hide container buttons. Uh, they do they provide a little hamburger menu and, and an X. I just think you lose context, and I just don't think they look that nice. Uh, so I always recommend building your own buttons. You can do this in PowerPoint really easily. Everybody's most people are pretty pretty familiar with with uh, PowerPoint, and I tend to just use sort of this rounded button, and I put some text in it. I'll show you. Let's just insert a new slide and forget the background color here, but it's really simple. All I have to do is go to insert shape, pick this sort of rounded square. I'm going to make the shape fill none. I'm going to make the outline kind of thicker. And for this case, I'm going to make it white. If you click on this, you'll see these little, little uh, dots here, this little yellow one, you can slide that and kind of adjust the, the roundedness of your, of your, uh, of your button and you can start just typing there but I tend to use a text box just so I can put it where I want and then we can just say your button make it larger whatever I'm not going to do that and then if we select everything and, and right click we can say as and save it as a picture and then we can just bring that right into Tableau you have a nice not much nicer looking button plus you hit give the user some context visually on where they're going next uh, like I said I created a bunch of buttons. You can download this from my Tableau Public website. It downloads into PowerPoint. Uh, you can use these, change colors, change icons, change text, and you have these buttons all laid out for you. Um, and, and thanks to Ken Fleur, which he helped me out with that as well. All right, just two more, and we're going to pass it over to, to Luke. Uh, fonts. This is something I find is 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 a struggle because people aren't aware that. Tableau doesn't allow you to just use any font you want. Well, it does allow you to use any font you want, but it doesn't mean that everybody else is going to see what you're seeing. So here's an example of four custom fonts I installed on my machine, on my laptop machine. This is what they look like. Um, and these are their names and what they look like. I then published that um, to Tableau Public, and then I opened it on my home uh, PC. And you can see what these fonts are rendered like. Um, these look like they're rendered by, as the same font. I don't know if it's Times New Roman or, or something like that, but they look nothing like the font that I used. This is a really common problem because you don't want to use some font that's really, really narrow, and then it gets rendered as a wide font, and it runs off the screen, and the user can't see the rest of it. Or it just looks bad because, you know, it's just a poor font for, for the data viz. So you have to be really careful with the fonts you use, and there are only certain ones that are truly safe. My brother just recently wrote an article called um, Demystifying Fonts in Tableau. The result of that is basically this. The Tableau font is the only one that's 100% going to render the same way every time, everywhere across the world. Um, it's always installed with Tableau Server, Tableau Online, and Tableau Public. But there are some other fonts. These are generally considered web safe fonts that are going to render the same in 99.9% .9 of circumstances. These fonts will render the same on just about any computer. If you're installing custom fonts, chances are those are not going to be um, rendered properly on another person's computer. Okay, so you need to be very careful with it. I should note, you can install custom fonts on Tableau Server, so you're doing stuff on Tableau Server, you can do that, um, and uh, it should render the render properly. All right, last thing I just talk about is, is white space. White space is, uh, is, is um, something that's probably underrated. Sometimes in work dashboards, we're trying to cram as much information as we can into one dashboard and use up all the space. And that becomes uh, something that's a, of a problem because it's really, really hard to read. There's no flow. You can see this example. I took a, a Tableau public viz that I did and I removed all the white space and you see these things are just crammed together. It's hard to tell where Eric Dickerson ends and Edron James uh, starts, even though they're different colors. And it's just sloppy looking, hard to follow, hard to read. Here's the actual visualization where I just have a little bit of white space, just a little bit of space between the elements. A lot of people like to put these dark borders or, or, or boxes around. I just don't think that stuff is necessary because you can do all that 
um, all that with just simple, simple white space. So this is pretty clear and easy to read. Um, for me, the master of white space is Pradeep Kumar. And I uh, check out his tablet public uh, profile. He's got some really great visas that just um, just use white space really, really well. And they're not hard to read, not, not cramped at all. Um, one other thing before I kind of forgot to mention, if you're wanting to use custom fonts, this goes back to the last slide. If you want to use custom fonts, you can. Uh, what you can do is you can bring those in as images. You can type them in. You can type your text into PowerPoint. You can uh, change it to whatever custom font you want. Here's bank shift. I like that a lot. You can, again, right click, save that as a picture. And then you can bring that picture into your in your Tableau visualization. I think I have an example here. This is a different font, not a website font. I just brought it in as an image. Now, I'll warn you, if you do that, you should um, be sure to add alt text here. Alt text allows it to be read when uh, with screen readers and things like that. So if you have anybody with any type of visual disability and you need screen readers, you should add the alt text to kind of describe what that image is saying. Okay. So sorry, I kind of jumped topics. All right, that's all I have. Again, um, all that information is on my, my website, on our website at Flirtless Twins. And uh, you can read through the blog post as well as a corresponding visualization to walk you through. It shows you the same things that I showed in this visualization. So, um, Luke, I don't know if we're going to take questions or we're just going to jump to you. You tell me. Um, there were a few questions that came through. I think I'm going to just kind of pick one or two here that I thought might be super okay. relevant to this conversation. And one's from Sri Krishna. Uh, he talked actually, you know, one chart that I've, I also see often is you've got bar charts that are time series by quarter and you color each, um, I guess, is it advisable, right? To color each of those bars by quarter across multiple years or is there an alternative that you would suggest? I hate to be like uh, Andy Cotgrave and say it depends. I, I guess it really just depends on what you're trying to trying to show. I, I could certainly see circumstances where coloring the quarter makes sense. Um, you know, if you're looking, if you're coloring by, you know, the quarter number, and you want to look, uh, you know, color so quarter one in each year are all colored the same. Maybe it makes sense if you're looking to compare the Q1 of 2019 to Q1 of 2020. Uh, so I certainly think there's there's circumstances where that very is very logical. Um, there's other circumstances where I'd probably just pull the color all together. So I guess it really I hate to have the generic answer, but yeah, I think it really depends. Yeah, uh, 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 you know, thinking about it from my side is it really depends uh, to your point of what it depends on being. Are you trying to highlight the differences in trends per quarter or are you trying to highlight the overall of the of right. the, you know, quarter by quarter over multiple years? And if you really are trying to break it out by quarter, I would say instead of using color, parsing that out into separate. Uh, right, Th throw it on uh, on rows as a dimension and be able to actually break out each individual quarter rather than uh, having alternating color because I think that you're going to lose your story a little bit uh, that you might be trying to pull together if you're trying to look at it truly quarter by quarter, uh, you know, same quarter year over year. Totally agree, Luke. Um, let's see, other questions. Uh, there's a, some discussion around how to work with fixed width versus automated width. I'm not sure if that's uh, something you want to bring up here, um, but whether you want to use fixed width dashboard or a dynamic dashboard. I always use fixed width. I, I'll be honest, I probably can't speak to the, um, I, I'm not a, a strong in this area. I will tell you that from day one, I've always used a fixed width dashboard. I know what it's going to render. I know how it's going to, what it's going to look like. Sure. Maybe it doesn't fit properly on certain screens, you know, mobile, it's going to look a little bit different. Right. But, um, um, but I always design with fixed width dashboards because I feel like it takes a lot of the variability out of that. I'm curious what you, what your thoughts are on that, Luke. Yeah, that's uh for me, it's an easy one. I always work with a fixed width dashboard. There, there are, there are some cases where you can make an argument for it, but the number one reason why you're going to use fixed width is, 
ultimately it's on server performance and on not your own personal experience, but if you're the first person loading it, you're gonna get the spinny wheel loading up the dashboard. But what's gonna happen on the back end is Tableau is gonna actually cache that experience. So if someone has the exact same layout and, and someone goes to render that same dashboard within the time limit of that cache, that it's gonna render essentially immediately versus having to re-render it. And when you have a dynamic dashboard with, it's go more or less very unlikely that it's gonna be the exact same monitor size from Kevin to right. myself, or even from right the one monitor I have here to the one that I'm about to present on over here. And it's gonna to have to re-render that. So that's the, you know, really to me, the big reason for it. Makes perfect sense. I'm learning, learning some stuff too. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you uh, taking an hour to go through the tips. They're actually really great tips. There's so many times when I wanted to just add, like second and third, some of the like, well, it's really just second, but it was like, I just want to like double stamp some of those and say like, these are absolute, they're things that when I'm doing individual trainings, uh, I'm trying to emphasize all the way. So it was really, you know, uh, to me, it was great to hear and see the examples and the consistency from you know one individual to the next. Appreciate it, Luke. Thanks for having me. So I guess I'm going to take over here, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll see how it goes. And I'll quickly give a, a an introduction of myself. Uh, thanks again, Kevin. By the way, uh, great presentation. If you're wondering, the question has come through. Yes, this is being recorded. Uh, at least I assume it's being recorded based on the settings that I have put in. So once that's done, they'll actually be available via the same link and I'll attempt to download them and try to do some other things with them. But um, yeah, they, it will be available afterwards, assuming that I didn't mess up any settings. Again, new platform for me here. But uh, again, about me, I have a two-time Tableau Zen Master now. I've been using it since 2013. Uh, I actually used it before 2013 uh, when I would, worked at, in higher education at the University of Minnesota, and I helped evaluate the tool in which I said, mm, I don't like this tool, I'll probably never use it. Uh, we'll move on to something else. And little did I know, four years later, I would be using the tool. I co-run something called Workout Wednesday, where we post a weekly challenge. If you live in the U.S., it actually comes out on Tuesdays, but it's already Wednesday in some other places. I blog um, at tesselationtech.io. That's the company that I co-run. And then um, I post what used to be sometimes weekly videos. And I actually did post one. And we're going to go through that exact same tip that I posted yesterday. Um, so you'll be able to see uh, how to build some KPIs. So that's really, oh, I guess I have more about myself. So I love posting, sharing this is because it's shown the evolution of my progress. So my very first Tableau public visualization is this one on the top left where it's, uh, the, the, I think they're ACT scores uh, by race and ethnicity. I worked in education. So that was, uh, you know, uh, really the, was a practical use for me to start using Tableau public. Uh, but uh, I was also thinking about how do I make my visualizations interactive? So having a drop down by selector, uh, I'm a data scientist by practice. So I was collecting data uh, on Minnesota Twins tickets uh, back when HubSpot, uh, uh, sorry, uh, StubHub had an API. And then it helped me to like buy and sell tickets whenever I wanted, find really good value. And I created a visualization in on Tableau Public to find those uh, well-priced games. It turns out that uh, mid-June a few years ago was when the Tampa Bay Rays were in town was a uh, was uh, a high value ticket. Blue is their underpriced versus the the the, uh, the Yankees the following week were a much higher price. Uh, I've sort of transitioned and thought more about um, how to do some more fun stuff. So I had this Harry Potter stretch cord Sankey uh, that required a lot of custom calculations to figure out. But more recently, and a lot more about what we're going to see today, I've been thinking about how to make more interactive uh, essential charts like tab tables and KPIs. And that's what I'll talk about today. Um, oh, just a couple other things about me. Uh, a co-lead uh, at Tessellation that's kind of sponsoring this. Uh, we're an analytics consulting firm. And I myself am located here in Minneapolis uh, to go with it. Uh, here's our website, and oh, I also have a two-year two-year-old daughter, and here's just some pictures of her recently from the summer. We spent lots of time together, um, and if you're wondering, hey, wh why do, why does she have a, a a coat and hat on? That's actually from the spring, but it's already snowing here in Minneapolis today. So um, 
is just a, a subtle reminder of how quickly the weather changes around here. So I'm gonna talk uh, about tables and KPIs and uh, we'll actually get to this table section in a second. But what I wanna do is walk through some best practices, uh, some common design principles that I'm using when I'm creating KPIs. And then we'll actually just hop into Tableau and, and build those out. So I've sort of taken uh, some examples that I've been able to find online, some inspiration and even my own designs and consolidate those KPI design ideas into a few different options. But uh, you know, when I think of KPIs, I think of there's just a handful of elements that ultimately go into them. Of that is usually the key performance indicator itself, the metric. So what we'll look at here are, are monthly numbers. Uh, particularly, we're gonna use the Superstore data set and I'm gonna set a filter to like the middle of a month. And of course, uh, I don't want to actually show an entire month. Of, I only want to show entire months of data. So if I'm not all the way through it, I want to create a filter that will filter that data out. So that it's, you know, if it's the middle of the month, let's not report on that number because you know the execs are only looking at a dashboard every once in a while. Uh, again, some people might be looking mid month, but uh, tactically, uh, it, or at least strategically, the information is only being used at a high level, even though data might be rolling in on the day to day. So. We're, when I look at my KPIs, I think of the like, uh, you know, Jeff Schaefer, which is Kevin's boss, helped co-write a book with uh, Steve Wexler and uh, Andy Cotgreave that talked about KPI design and calling them bands. Uh, and those bands, uh, uh, very large numbers, uh, are calling out. We I always put them on my dashboard, but I always feel like they need context of some sort. So for me, it's you know making that big number and then ha making sure that there's context associated with it. So in this case, uh, I've got the label of sales to call out it that it's sales and the year over year change. And sometimes we use month over month, but almost always we're actually trying to do year over year comparisons to that. So, um, you know, that, that's one thing that we're going to, that it really comes down to. And then, a lot of it is actually formatting and trying to figure out what the best format is. It should we have it center aligned or should we have it left aligned or do we need to have it left like aligned, but also have some sort of indicator. So, you know, we did have arrows that are red and blue calling them up or down, but could we get away with maybe not having arrows? Maybe like arrows are a little bit too pedantic. So having just like a, some sort of bar or a line or some sort of indicator that's not just the arrows itself. So uh, we, we actually will create this third one here uh, together in, in the time that I have. Um, one way that you can actually call out your KPIs is just to, you know, if you've got an all white dashboard, and sometimes I do this, is just change the background color of all the KPIs. It helps it stand out that whole bar all across, uh, all is one. Or I'll just like put a nice, as Kevin alluded to, put an outline around all those KPIs. And I put like a little bit of a divider in there. So it's, you know, while they're, I'm actually gonna go into presentation mode. It might even make it a little bit easier to see here. Um, well, you could do that. Uh, there's also your brand standards to consider. So from the this KPI that I just looked at with these essentially cards, and the next one, it's, uh, it's frankly just some formatting. And that formatting might be like, let's make the number even bigger. Uh, and notice how the number is just a little bit bigger, but I made that font a little bit finer. And again, what I'm doing here is actually just trying to match some existing consistency and rules. Uh, and I actually call out instead what this metric is. So it's change year over year. It's not very clear when I look at this, at this, uh, at the arrow itself. So sometimes, it's all about you know playing around and trying to figure out how that b value is best served. Uh, for this next example, I've pulled it from tableaumagic.com, and uh, I, I saw an example, and I was like, "How can I replicate that?" I really like that design where it's you know it's just the number and the value, just all kind of standard, but really nice, clean visualization. Uh, you could change the background color. So uh, Kevin just talked about how the that if you accidentally zoom in, that just happened to me here. Um, and these are actually custom map backgrounds that change based on um, if, you, if your value changes. 
So uh, different backgrounds, different colors, and this is a gradient. It's actually just an image. You could put any image in the background and it work, would work just fine. Now, all of these examples up until now um, have not really had anything but what's the equivalent of the year over year value to compare it to, whether it's actually showing that value or the percent change. To me, the next logical step is to put in a spark line or some sort of spark chart uh, that shows that year over year, uh, it, it, the monthly change so that it's something that I can track progress on. So uh, I took inspiration on this one from Google Analytics when recreating it to put it into the visualization and we'll create some spark lines together today. Uh, the way that we can create, by the way, these KPIs, we can do that on one sheet. Uh, it's not as easy to pull off uh, a one sheet uh, uh, spark line. So you'll often have to create these as separate sheets. So it's, you know, create one, come up with a really good format for it and then bring in the rest. And again, we're gonna do that together. Um, here's an example, actually replicated straight from the New York Times during COVID. The, there was a little bit of a financial crisis going on. We didn't know what was going to happen. The markets were very uncertain. I actually went in and replicated the visualizations that they were creating uh, on the day to day. But just, you know, I was like, what if I could do that for an entire year? So again, having the same metrics, but just showcasing that spark line. And just some other alternatives of being like, instead of having it below, maybe we put it off to the side. This was inspired by one of my colleagues, John Emery. Um, and then to me, another great option is uh, actually showing a percent to progress chart. So how close are we? Well, these the, all these have shown up to the recent month. Here's like a year to date metric and how that year to date metric compares to the target. So being able to say, you know, we are on target, they're all blue, and this dark line is where we would be anticipated to be at relative to prior years. So that's a, a fun one. And uh, that's where the, the, you know, these start to become a little bit more heavy, by the way, is after this one from John Emery. It's not just like a two sheet or five sheet solution anymore. It's actually, you know, separate sheets for eight parts on this one. And this visualization is also, believe it or not, uh, eight sheets as well. And then we have this, you know, monthly review revenue, and then the change and the spark line, which we have three separate visualizations being put into this, but it looks really cool to have the KPI, you know, not standing out as much, right? My really, my important value is this percent change more than anything. Um, and uh, I've seen alternatives. So this one's from Adam McCann. Adam uh, created this one and put it on, on his Tableau Public. And it's a great way to track sales and progress over a year. So instead of showing, you know, the, as the next month comes in, Adam keeps the prior year rolling in as well. And then for my final one, uh, I, I saw a really cool design by uh, the Twilio KPI. So the website that uh, Twilio, it, uh, you can uh, sort of do different things using APIs. And they had like a downward arrow and an upward arrow. And I was like, I'd really like to recreate that. So this is recreated um, using two separate sheets here. Actually, it's one sheet, I take that back, but there, it takes a little bit of finessing uh, for this bottom part and then the KPI itself. So I've talked a lot about some designs. What I wanna actually do is create these designs. And I wanna show you how to create them really fast. So I've opened up Superstore data. And what I wanna do to begin with is I'm actually gonna come in here and I'm gonna add uh, and I'm gonna extract my data, but I'm also gonna add a filter just so that we can pick a random day in a year. So I just wanna go find uh, order date and I'm gonna hit okay. And let's set that range of dates, right? So the data in here goes from the, basically the beginning of 2017 through fictional data through the end of 2020. Let's just pretend instead today's like 5, 17, 2020. So we're not even all the way through a month. Um, and I only want to report the last full month of data. How do I do that? Um, it's actually pretty easy if you use table calculations. And that's why I was like, let's present that today. There's a, you know, a much more difficult way to do it and much more like a slightly more performant way. But the way that I've, I've more recently started doing this is that I will take now this calculation order date. I'll throw it up on columns here and let me set it to month. So you see, I have a tick for every single month, uh, including May. So first let's get rid of May. I'm gonna create a new calculated field and I'm just gonna call it order date. 
oh, sorry, I'm just going to call it full months. And this is going to be a Boolean, a true false that's only going to return full months. I'm just going to say order date, and I'm going to use date trunk. It's a calculation that will truncate a date to the most recent month, week, quarter, year. And then single quotes and lowercase, I'm going to type month. And then I'm going to use a curly brace and type max order date and curly brace. This whole little curly brace section is actually just going to return the max date in my entire data set, which in this case is the 17th of May. With date trunk, it's going to get me to the first of the month uh, of May 1st with all this chunk, which means that my, my Boolean here will be true if it's anything less than the first of the month. Uh, which is exactly what I want to return in this case. So I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to go search for this, and I'm going to put this up on filters. And I'm going to hit True. When I hit True, you'll notice there goes that month. Bye-bye. Uh, May, it's all gone. What I need to do now is actually start to build out my KPIs. Um, and here's the trick. I'm actually going to take month, and I'm just going to drag it on the detail because I only really want this month of April to return. I'll show you how to get there in a second. Let's actually just get the values I want to show up on that on that on that tip first. So I'm gonna go find sales, and um, I'm gonna put that on label. Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to do the placeholders first. Um, I want to just double click on columns and type min 0, 0.0. And every time I do this, it's just gonna create a placeholder marks card. So when I hit enter, you know, I have one marks card. That's not a surprise. But if I were to repeat this process, you'll notice I have now have a second marks card that looks the exact same. And I could do this two more times, min 0.0, .0 and maybe I'll do it a third, fourth time as well. So I'm gonna do four KPIs. And normally you'd be like, well, that's a lot of work to do uh, you know, on my time, but I'm gonna show you how we can actually create all this very fast. I'm going to start by finding sales, and we'll make this first marks card sales. And by the way, if you ever want to you know, select your marks card, you can just click on a value, and it will take you to that marks card. So I've just clicked on this first uh, measure that I ad hoc created, and I'm just going to bring out sales on label. And let's make this uh, entire view so we'll sort of see those values come through. If I just hover, uh, remember that I have every single month overlapping here, by the way. Uh, but I only want to return one month. And you're going to be like, Luke, how am I going to get one month? Um, right now it says January 17, uh, 2017. Just know that they're, all the months are there because I have month on detail on these cards. Um, next, I'm going to take sales, and I'm going to bring it out on detail. So I have it showing up again. But I'm going to do a table calculation. I want to do that year-over-year -year change in, in, um, in sales. So I'm just going to right-click. I'm going to choose add table, quick table calculation, and I'm going to choose percent difference. And that created a table calculation for me. I'm just going to right click and edit this table calculation and make sure that for my percent difference from, I'm going to check month of order date. I wanted to use that in my table calculation. And then I'm just going to double click. And if right now the default setting is basically look back one month. If I change this to 12, after I double click on it, and there's another one just halfway through the calculation. If I also change that to 12, it's going to look back 12 months. So now if I you know, click and finish that calculation, if I hover here, I'm not going to have a value for the most recent month. But if I just sort of cheat, I'll bring this out here for the time being. You'll notice I've got calculations that are coming through. And um, let me just double check. Uh, I just know it's going to show up. Um, even though the, yeah, there it is. You can sort of see on the tooltip, uh, if I'm looking uh, at the most recent month, go all the way to the top, you'll see uh, 0 0.058. That's basically a 6% year over year change. I'm just going to bring this back onto detail because I don't want it there. Uh, let's get a single mark to show up. I've got, you know, uh, basically, if I look at this, like 40 overlapping marks at this point. I only want one. I'm just going to double click into this space underneath this marks card. I'm going to type last equals zero. We're going to use the last function. It's basically what was the last value, uh, and this is a table calculation. So we can actually customize how this comes through. But I'm just going to right click 
and then edit my table calculation and make sure I select month of order date. So I make sure that my last month of order date, uh, it'll actually, you know, when it is that last month, the value will be zero, zero. And then I have this Boolean. So I'm just gonna drag this over. And what I did is I dragged it over onto the calculation pane here on the data pane. It saved it out as a calculation. So if I look, there it is, last equals zero. But now I can also just drag it up on filters and select true. And now you'll notice that I have those values showing up. It's just a single mark. Uh, I'm gonna just point down here. It says four marks, one, two, three, and four. If I control Z that, you'll notice that down in the corner here, it does say 160 marks. So I reduce the number of marks showing up on my visual stabilization. It's still doing the table calculation, by the way, on my view here, because we also have a table calculation filter. And the thing about the Tableau's order of operations is that this filter is going to show up last. So, you know, as everything renders, the last step is a table calculation filter or one of them in this case. Uh, and that allows us to render a, a table calculation then filter on a table calculation. From there, I'm just gonna do some formatting. I can click on label, edit my text, and um, let's go find my pop-up. It's probably on a separate uh, sheet somewhere else. There it is, I'll bring it over. And now I just need to organize my text. And again, the way that I do this is I just put sales on one line and I'm gonna put my percentage on another line and I'm gonna put my label. And in this case, I'm gonna put all caps. It doesn't always have to be, uh, but I'm gonna type out sales. And I'm gonna change, and this is pretty standard for me, whatever my title font is, I usually go two and a half to three times larger. So for it's size nine here, I'm just gonna do 24. And because it's so much larger, I actually think that I'm gonna use Tableau Lite. It's a subtle change in the font itself, but it will render just a little bit different. And then for this KPI, uh, sorry, that change metric that's providing the context, I don't need it to be black. Like I don't need it to stand out. I need it to be auxiliary supporting. So what I'll do when I have an auxiliary measure like this, is I'll just change it to be this lightest gray down below. So I'm just gonna click that value. And now I've providing that context to my uh, KPI here. Now things are sort of centered a little bit interesting on this visualization. It's kind of like, mm, Luke, I'm not really into it being like off center. Well, you can just edit the axis on each of these axes that we've put into place here by right clicking, editing the axis. And then I'm just gonna change my fixed value to be from negative 0.1 to, to one. And you'll notice that that value is now shifted over inside the box. Of course, it's added grid lines and I've got all these divider lines. So what you're gonna have to do at some point is get rid of those. So I'm just gonna go format and let's get rid of all of those lines. Uh, I'm gonna start with my divider lines, get rid of row divider, and I'm gonna get rid of column divider. And then of course, go back in and remove, you can remove zero lines and rulers and grid lines, but always those pesky grid lines always manage to continue to show up. So I make sure that I deselect all of them there as well. And then I can just uncheck my show header eventually. Uh, we're not there yet because I was gonna create my other uh, other KPIs, actually you know, trying to monitor the time, I might actually pass on that. Uh, but I might go through one more just to show you how fast and now that we have that set up, it takes to build. Um, so let's do one more again, showing those same steps. I'm just gonna click on min 0.0, .0 here. And then I'm just gonna go find profit. Actually, I'm gonna pick an existing uh, uh, me measure that's an ag aggregate. And we have profit ratio that's already been created here. It's just sum of profit divided by sum of sales. Before this was a, you know, it was a, it was a measure, but it wasn't aggregated for this first, uh, for this first measure, right? We see sum of sales. So what happens if I bring profit ratio onto, to my label? Well, it shows the correct value. And if I want to also again calculate that percent difference, I can just right click, choose quick table calculation, choose percent different and then edit that table calculation and make sure I choose month. And then finally, I'm going to um, double click and change this to be 12 and 12. So if I get their values, 
bring it out on label, and I have my my change as well. So, uh, not a really uh, great month for April, by the way, with these these values um, to to sort of showcase. But that's how easy it is, right? I've set this all up. I can actually just add in unlimited measures, whether they're aggregates or not, right away. And there's not a lot of work to going in to create these uh, KPIs. How would I, you know, create an indicator from here? Well, if I wanted to create an arrow up or down, there's a couple of different ways that you can create those arrows. So the easiest way, if you're all right with the color being gray, is to actually just format the existing calculation. And you just right click and choose format. And then from there, you can just click on your numbers. And I'm gonna change that to a percentage. Um, did I select the right values? I'm on the right, wrong marks card. You'll notice it updated over there. Let's try that again. Just right click and choose format and then choose percentage. And I'm gonna get rid of my decimals all the way, but I can choose custom. And in custom formatting, by the way, by choosing percentage, if I chose one decimal, if I go back to percentage, you'll see the custom formatting automatically changed, but you can do custom formatting of your numbers and you can customize basically the positive values the negative values and the zero values. So right now I'm gonna format my positive values and I wanna put an arrow in front of that. What I can do is go find an ASCII two code or an ASCII code. And I think I have them actually hiding behind this presentation um, and I'll go find an arrow. So I've got an arrow up here. I'm just gonna copy it and then bring it back over and paste that in here and you'll notice I've got an up arrow going with a negative number. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but if I put a semicolon, I can then sort of repeat the same process. After the semicolon, by the way, I'm gonna put an argument in here for my zero values. And of course, um, let's fix that. Go back in here, I copied and pasted and Tableau did not like my pasting. Um, and I can come back in here and just type 0%, and that'll be my negative value, and then grab an arrow down, automatically copying, and then let's place that arrow down in afterward. And then the final argument is you can do for the zero value, which is a third semi, a second semicolon and a third set of values. And you'll notice now we have arrows showing up and down. Um, very easy to um, set up here. So um, from there, you know, d depending on your user, uh, you, you might be able to get away with single colored arrows. I've got clients that are you know, very specific and they're like, I want arrows that are different color going up and different color going down. Uh, you know, you're gonna share in my pain in, this, in that process, but you have to essentially create separate calculations for each of those arrows. But you can use this calculation that you just wrote here. And I'm just gonna click and drag that value over and now if I search ZN, because it includes ZN, you'll notice I brought that calculation in. I could call this percent change. This is where things get a little bit more dicey in creating these calculations. Uh, but I'm just gonna call this percent change of sales. And what I'm gonna do with that percent change of sales, rather than creating the arrows, I'm actually just gonna uh, change the indicator color here. Uh, and I can do that by just doing an ad hoc calculation by saying percent change sales is greater than zero. So if it's greater than zero, it'll be one color. And if it's less than or equal to, it'll be another. Uh, so I now have this, you know, it's again, it's a bar. It's a very small bar, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's there. If you don't want to use that, like, right, um, it defaulted to bar, I could choose Gantt. And then I can say, let's just type in like 0.04. And I'll change this to a minimum. And then if I put this on size on a Gantt bar, it'll actually change the size of this bar. Uh, and then that way I can make that a lot easier to see in the end. And then when I size this right, it's become super easy to resize this bar to sort of match with my KPIs as I go. So that's a, you know, that's a little trick that I personally use when I'm creating my KPIs. So that that's KPI. Right, I've kind of over explained this, but that's my KPIs and how they work. Um, and this is, by the way, this is this visualization is only driven off the most recent data. So if you're like trying to have filters, I saw a question that came through is like, what if I want my users to select the month? You've got to use a different methodology for it. But uh, 
uh, same thing. Uh, you've got the, uh, it's just a, a different way to do it when you want to have a really quick automated way to have these KPIs rolling in. So KPIs, there's a, oh, uh, you know, I was planning on creating all these. Uh, by the way, I want to just make a quick spark line while I'm at it to go with the sales value. So let's create one spark line that goes with my sales here. And I have really two ways that I like to create these. Uh, and I'll show you the easier one or my preferred method to go with this is number one, I'm going to create two calculations. I'm going to create uh, a sales for last year calculation and a sales for this year calculation. And then all I have to do is say, uh, let's call this sales CY for current year. I'm just going to say if order date, I specifically I'm going to use year. Um, I'm sort of cheating a little bit by using the year function. If you want to hear me talk about performance, year isn't the best option, but for speed, it works in this case. And I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to use the year function. And once again, I'll use that max order date uh, trick. And in fact, this curly brace max order date is sort of my favorite calculation to write. It's so handy, so functional across the board. Um, whenever I need to, to you know, use anything date related to the most recent data. And then I can just say sales and end. And I have my first calculation here. And then I'm going to go find that calculation and duplicate it. I want to duplicate this calculation. I'm going to edit and just say year minus one and create a prior year calculation. I've got my two calculations. Now I just need to sort of build out my spark line which I'm just going to do by, um, actually I'm gonna do it the right way, which not everybody knows, is if you're gonna create a spark line, you're probably your first thought is to use order date and bring it out on the view, but you wanna really create your own custom date fields so that you don't have the, the hierarchy that Tableau brings in, right? If I just brought this out on my view, I get the plus and the minus no matter what. And the way you get rid of that is by creating a custom date. So I'm just gonna right click, choose create custom date, and I'm going to choose months. And I have two choices on months. I can return the date part, which is the actual part of the month, and that's what I'm interested in, or the date value, which is really the month year combination. So I'm just gonna select date part, hit okay, and I'm gonna bring this out on columns. Now, when I create these visuals, I personally am not a big fan of the, the bucketing of, 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 of a, of a a dimension, and so I will actually change this into a continuous dimension and just has those little ticks there. That's fine that I have numbers. I can actually go back and change that by going to format and then just choosing dates. And let's just show the first letter. And I gotta make sure that I do that on the axis. So first letter, now it's just showing up and it's continuous. And the, the subtle difference here is, especially if I'm making a spark bar chart. So now I can just take my sales I have two values, current and prior year, and I can make a decision whether I want to use a dual axis chart or a combined axis. Uh, both work great in this situation. So I'm just bringing prior year out here, and I can bring current year out on the axis and create that dual axis chart. Um, and th that's really, right, the, the, the challenge has more or less been created. Uh, now, with a spark line, right, it's a small, small version of the existing chart. Um, so I would just, you know, get rid of my headers in the end. Uh, but again, I, I said that I would bring this up for bars. So just, you know, working with bars. Oh, that looks terrible. I'm going to keep it as lines for the time being. Um, but then I just need to format and get rid of everything really on my visualization and, and sort of look at that visual as if it was, uh, you know, extremely, extremely small. And it's going to look something like this. Now that I've shrunk it down, by the way, the key here is that I also want to change the size. If you change the size of that mark, it just you know pops a little bit better. And I'll change that prior year to be a lighter gray here in that process. Maybe that's even too, too gray, it's too dark at this point. Um, and again, I want those full months. So I'm just going to bring in that full months filter. And that's how I'm going to create these. You know, it, it's uh, it's repeat this process over and over, and then I'm going to put each of these into a set of containers on my dashboard, and it will really sort of make my visualization pop. So I've gone way over in terms of my time on uh, explaining KPIs. I've got 20 minutes to talk about tables, uh, which are the other really important part here. 
but I do want to point out how I go about creating tables. Uh, and I, for me, tables is all about formatting when it comes down to it. And that, you know, when we're working with Tableau standard tables, and then it's to start designing outside of that existing table structure, by actually creating visualizations that look like tables. And what I mean by that, we'll, we'll take a look at it in a second, but I do want to call out how I personally make tables. One, I want to make sure that I use a readable font size. You know, I'm guilty of it as well as probably all of us when we start making tables. We're like, how do we cram as much information into a tiny little space on our dashboard? Well, let's make the, the spacing really narrow and the fonts as small as possible. But reality is no one can probably read that. So uh, the first thing that I have to say is like, make sure your font size is readable. Second, we're going to make sure that those headers distinguish from the body. We're going to add more spacing in and not be afraid to put it in there. Like, I personally feel, and that we all are working from the modern web, which means we all are used to scrolling on our phones or scrolling on our computers, and there's really an unlimited amount of space as a result. So we shouldn't be afraid to actually use the space on our dashboard and make tables larger than maybe we think they should be. Like they should have space to read and we shouldn't be afraid to do that. And then of course, choose font friendly tables. Kevin already discussed some of the fonts that are accessible in Tableau and it's, it's a really a double down on that, frankly. So when I'm creating a table, if I'm just, again, creating a standard table, which we all have to do, including myself as a Zen, Zen master with this, you know, this ethereal higher level, I still have to do it. Um, and I'm not, I personally think that we should, you know, dive into tables more and not be afraid. But if I'm personally creating a table, I'm gonna create a customer name table here. And I just wanna bring in a bunch of values. I'm just gonna double click on discount and profit and quantity and sales. And I've built out this table. Um, you know, you, you might think, let's stick with Tableau's default formatting. That's a great place to go. It actually sort of hits on all the rules that we just sort of talked about, which is, you know, there's enough space to read it. The font's still an okay size, but I actually, my audiences want something that's usually a little bit larger in terms of font size. So I'm just going to come in here and format this and, right, let's actually make this readable. I'm, I'm going to make it size 11 and I'm going to choose Tableau uh, book font as well. And that's the same font that we'll have actually on our view, on our visualization. And I'm just going to change the font as well to 11 to be consistent as possible. And now you'll see my headers, by the way, are a little bit larger. And all it is for me now is, frankly, adding in space and not being able to say, like, right, I've added in space and it's made it just that touch more readable at this point. So now we've got a nice table that can be read. And again, I'm not afraid to use the space uh, that I have. And I personally am not a big fan of the uh, of you know filling each row. I personally, uh, when I'm working in formatting, I choose to put in a, a row divider and I make it just like a really light row divider to go with it. And then I actually get rid of the the banding that goes with it, both here. So just, you know, it's something really subtle and it's a table, uh, but th this is how I personally would design a base table. But, you know, eventually our audience is gonna get bored of working with uh, base tables. So what can you do next? Well, uh, for that, I would recommend thinking of some alternatives. And like Kevin, I created 26 examples of different types of table designs. So here's my base table that I'm working with and things that I can do to really make it pop. So with my first design, it was like, right, let's just make a number bold in a table. That's a way to call out a number, whether it's being successful or unsuccessful, it's up to you to figure out. The next way I did it was not just with uh, bold, but actually add a little bit of color. Again, nice simple technique that I'm using here. Both of these tables, like the KPIs, actually use the min zero technique where I'm double clicking and putting in the value. What that means is that these headers are custom headers and you can use set actions or parameter actions to actually drive and resort so it functions like a typical table. But really what we have here isn't a typical table. To do this, we have actually have to create a visualization that looks like a table, uh, but operates, um, you know, really as a series of different charts. And I'm using the Gantt mark type again here, 
or a bar chart to call out the values. <coughs> um, but what that allows me to do is not just highlight color or change the font, but to change individual column colors as we go, or uh, you know, or highlight individual cells within a, sing a column and allow me to work with different colors in different ways. Um, I could create little, you know, and this is one of my personal favorites is I just create a, a, a dot rather than coloring the whole cell because that cell can become quite intimidating. And especially if I'm trying to scan uh, across multiple rows and I'm able to do that. Uh, but in addition to just, you know, using it as a, as, as a mark, I can create a text for it as well. So it's just a subtle difference. And using this technique with min zero, I can actually put secondary values in each row. So the same way I created those KPIs, if I went back there, I could just add in a dimension on rows and it could build out a set of KPIs into a table. Same thing, we just saw this, this is my KPIs. Imagine again, one just value there. Uh, but it's more than just arrows or numbers or color or font. You can actually start to incorporate different chart types. So in this case, we could add bars by just doing uh, you know, side by side bar chart uh, with the value. So if I just come in here and take a look at it, right? I've still got min zeros coming in, but what I do for this chart type is I use a Gantt bar and size it by the sales themselves. So it's a nice, easy way to add it in. And again, when I create a table, quote unquote table, uh, by the way, this, uh, I forgot to call this out. As soon as I start to add these visual components into a table, it's actually a dashboard. This is the definition, the standard definition of a dashboard. It's the combined use of visual aids within a table itself to build out and understand this data. So when I'm looking at the accessories row in my dashboard here, I can see that the sales are going up. Or if I'm looking at any other value, if I'm looking at supplies, it's basically really static. I see machines being able to be called out as a high level value, and I can actually see the value that goes with it as well. This is a dashboard. Um, and you can also get creative with this. So I was like, how could I put the positive values in front of the, uh, to the right of the text and the negative values to the left? This one didn't turn out exactly how I wanted, but it still looks like it's interesting in concept to be able to call that out. Um, it allows you to put more than just bars and lines, right? You can put any chart type in there. So here I'm using the Cleveland dot plot. It's one of Spencer Bauke's favorites, uh, one of our uh, Tessellation team members. Uh, and in addition, right, it doesn't just have to be a static line. Like I could put a dual axis line chart in here to sort of call out any value that I want repeated over, I can put into my visualization. Um, and uh, I, as soon as I start combining those values together, I can create various different charts that are you know, providing dashboards that are providing information that go beyond tables. And I, one of my personal favorites, by the way, is the Spark Bar line, Spark Bar here, where I can, uh, again, add some annotation inside, uh, some visual representation inside the charts to really call out the values. What's interesting about this table to me is that I look at tables, I see it's performing poorly, but I also see that it's performed poorly historically. So it's really interesting to be able to look at those values and how they come out. Uh, in addition to that, um, I don't just need to use, like, right, I, I can use charts to add context, but I can also, or, or you know, actual visual context uh, to go with that. So I don't need to actually have a, uh, a visual that is a line or a bar, or uh, you sort of name it or different colors, I can actually use that to add context to my visualization. So being able to just call out the, these are subcategories in my data, be able to like group those together. So like, right, uh, I don't know if I have this set up in here, but I had it at one point where I could sort based on clicking on any of these values and sort it to the top for the group that it belongs to. Uh, so it's just, again, that is a separate visualization here. Um, uh, and then again, I can use different line and mark types to go with it. But one of my favorites personally is that when I've create a dashboard, you know, a, a standard dashboard is to add arrows in here at the end that are that look like buttons, but really they drive to a separate dashboard that can call out the context of that visualization, right? So I can just, you know, I want to, if I want to see how the orders for accessories perform, I can just click through on that. 
Um, and now I got to figure out which shortcut button to use here. I oh, can't navigate back right now. Uh, but again, it just allows me to drive through. And when I'm published to server, normally uh, I would be able to navigate back to the original dashboard, making it look like it's a seamless dashboard, even though it's two separate dashboards. Um, again, calling out numbers at the, the, at the front here. And um, uh, I like to also put ranks of things on my dashboards, especially for experts. But uh, by the way, the alt click wasn't working on my computer. Um, so, you know, it's calling out my ranks and being able to look at the change in there as well. Um, and you can get super creative whether I'm putting, you know, three stars or having filled dots with stars or even, uh, you know, making it look like I have a list within a table. And finally, I just wrap things up here. You know, we, this one, Kevin was an, gave me this idea a long time ago, uh, but just being able to rank things out and, and just to wrap up, right, uh, that percent to target coming back to that interesting percent to plan visualization. I can actually build that out within each of these. Uh, visuals. So um, I'm going to take, uh, you know, I'm running close on time here. So I'm going to just sort of take a look at any of the questions that we have um, to see what we've got. Thanks for everybody who sent out um, questions. I wasn't able to tag them as I went here. Um, yeah, the Gantt KPI, uh, text is overlapping on the Gantt line. So if you do have overlapping text. That's a great question. Just some housekeeping on these fast tables. Things that you can do to make sure that your text sort of aligns great is to just make sure that you allow the labels to overlap, but then change your alignment to be both right and middle. And that'll sort of fix it into place here. And of course, you're going to want to turn off those tooltips at some point. Um, and I can do that because it's on another sheet here, but just you know, delete this out and hit OK. And you'll notice now I don't have a tooltip, and it's really truly functioning like a KPI. Or you can put a, a vis and tooltip or just text to provide additional context as well. So um, let's see if I can catch any other questions that might have come through. How do you give color multiple measures? Yep. Yeah, so the, the multiple measures trick that I'm doing here um, is, again, just cheating a little bit and typing min 0.0, .0 and creating a separate column in my data source so that when I bring in say subcategory, I can uh, control the color on a separate column versus another column. So each column itself is a separate, um, it's a separate really marks card. And that's the key here. Um, again, same thing for dynamically bolding text. If I would just, you know, um, in this case, we'll use, um, I need to say if it's profitable, for instance, I could create a calculation that uh, if it's profit ratio greater than zero, then let's show sum of sales. And I can just say sales conditioned on profitable. I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to bring this out on label. It should show up over here. So all of my profitable sales are showing up. And then if I wanted not profitable, it also labels for it. So I'm just going to find my profitable calculation. I'm going to duplicate it. And uh, you know, I'm simplifying this because there are you know, equal to 0, but I'm just going to say less than or equal to here to cover off all the other values. And I'll say not profitable. So I now have these two sets of values, one that's profitable, one that's not. I'm going to bring not profitable out there. It doesn't look like any difference on my visual, but then I can just edit the text here. And for my profitable values, I'm just going to add some bold and it calls out those values. Or if that's a little bit too intense, I can turn off the bold and I could change my not profitable and add some color here. And then we're able to call those values out. Um, I do plan on publishing this out. It should be out tomorrow or on Wednesday so that everybody can get access to it. Um, you know, I definitely want to wrap things up here as well. Uh, just sort of to wrap up on, on, you know, on my side of things here is that I think it's important to know that uh, first tables 
plus visualizations, that's a dashboard. And frankly, your users love dashboards. We all, you know, so I, I personally think that if you're gonna create these custom tables, um, they're, they're gonna provide greater engagement, you're gonna have improved, and as a result, have hopefully um, improved decision-making from it. So for me, the natural progression is when you're creating these tables or really just dashboards, you've got something uh, really great to use. And if uh, you know we're running short on time and I have to be very prompt on finishing up because it's just gonna cut off the room here in a few minutes. Uh, but if you wanna connect, here's my email, luke.stanky at Consulting at Luke Stanky on Twitter, and then my LinkedIn as well. Um, and I uh, wish I would have put Kevin's information on here, but he did have, I believe, some information up earlier. So also props to Kevin for presenting. Yep, Kevin just threw it in on Slack, or sorry, on a, on a message here. Uh, so yeah, Flair, FlairLidgeK at gmail.com, FlairLidgeTwins.com, and at FlairLidgeKev on Twitter. Thanks, Kev, uh, for being able to throw that out there. Um, if you, like I said, if you need anything, appreciate it. Uh, thanks for attending. And we'll try to do another one of these in the future if it seems like it was a, it was a pretty good thing. So thanks again, everyone.